And so in here, we're going to just hop through and do some more making. This is deliberately a little bit shorter. I'm gonna try uh, and keep tonight's class buttoned up a little bit tighter so that we have some time to just play around in Fusion 360 because there's definitely quirky parts. And I, um, it's one of the things that, that after years of doing it, it's hard sometimes to remember what are the things that I can just do. So I wanna make sure that we have a chance to explore later how do you make things in Fusion? What are the weird hiccups that you're seeing that I can probably help with that are, that are probably at this point common questions? It's a really useful thing. Uh, and so we're gonna keep going about design in 3D, but one of the cool things about this week is that we're gonna talk about making from 3D design software that is not just, um, that is not just strictly 3D printing. And hopefully at this point, you've gotten a 3D printer badge and 3D printed something. It's a fun little exercise, and we're going to talk about that more tonight too, but we're also going to talk about expanding those horizons, and I think you'll find some really cool skills and features in, in where we explore with this. So there's lots of things to go after. This like first example is a little cardboard car that's made out of laser-cut cardboard and then wheels or laser-cut acrylic. Um, it's a mousetrap-powered car that some students of mine made, and we built a whole bunch of these because we kept destroying them accidentally or whatever but not for the reasons you'd expect. Like this car made out of cardboard is actually strong enough that I can stand on it. So in the right configurations, you can really do interesting things with materials to build in interesting ways. And we're gonna explore that a lot this tonight. So first up, we're gonna address what is G-code because that is its own whole topic that, that we're gonna revisit many, many times. Then we're gonna go through some more advanced 3D printing concepts because a lot of people love to 3D print. Uh, and I, I do, I like to print for different things, but we're gonna see some different tricks that you can use to level up your 3D printing game if you've already got some skill there. Then we'll talk briefly about 3D scanning technologies uh, and a few other updates. But one that's exciting is an old friend of mine who's, who does a lot of 3D art and scanning at Smith College up in Massachusetts has said that maybe Tuesday next week, I think it's Tuesday next week, he would be up for just a conversation where we can chat about what's going on. He has like a canned presentation about 3D scanning, 3D printing and 3D design. And so we could listen to that and then also have a conversation with him, which would be cool. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about two and a half design and then DXFs at the end. So this is sort of our, our map for where we're going with all these topics for tonight. So first up, STLs and G-code. Last week, we talked about STLs, just like this, that those are the triangular shapes that get output by a design software. So if you're designing in Fusion, you're describing the circles and, and cylinders or, or cubes of the geometry, but that isn't geometry that really works anywhere outside of Fusion. It's all described by files inside of Fusion 360. And when you wanna export it, just like, exporting out of Word, you'd hit print to PDF in the same exact way you export to an STL. And so STLs use triangles to represent complicated shapes like this. And if you're, well, when we open up Fusion 360 later, there's a button so you can actually see the triangles when you go to export, which is a cool trick. But really, I think the, the, tricky, bar, the tricky bit of going from a 3D design to 3D printed things is here in the middle. So STLs are a little mysterious because they're all triangles. And then the G code is its own whole thing uh, that you might've heard applied to different pieces and parts around Makehaven. So I think it's worth a little deeper dive. STLs are all completely triangles. And so I really love these different examples to show it. Like this is the globe uh, built out of a real low poly STL. And if you've ever played a game where it's a low poly game, uh, there's a VR one where you're like, dodging bullets or something. There's there's a bunch of different games that are out there that are low poly, it's become popular. Super hot. That's it, super hot. Super hot's the game where it's low poly action. Uh, and so it's relatively easy to render because computer games get harder to render the more triangles there are. And so STLs just describe uh, geometry in, in this triangular relationship. So in any case, you bring in an STL, whatever slicer you're gonna be playing with, it's all triangles inside. But then from those STLs, what you need to have in order to get a tool to do anything with it 
is not the triangles, but you have to get it converted to G code. And that's what yes, last week feels like yesterday, last week, we talked about slicers. And so slicers will take that 3D geometry of the STL and they'll turn it into G code. Uh, I like this little GIF here. I went on to NC viewer or machine code, which is numerical code viewer. And so it's rolling through an example cut and you can see this gray thing moving back and forth. That's the tool head. And then these here on the left are instructions for how that tool head should be moving. So a lot of the time it's going like down and up and, and along the Y axis and along the Z axis. And so you can see sort of two columns of action. And then every so often a bigger blurb comes along because it's turning as it goes around a corner to the next stripe. So G code is really just literally the instructions for where to move a tool head for any tool that you use to make. And in, and in our case this week, that's gonna be mostly 3D printers. So G code is largely just like a literal list of actions that a printer should take so that it can move its print head around. And slicers do magical software things inside to go from an STL all the way to where do I move the print head to make that happen. And, and the good news is, is that you will never need to learn how this works. That that's like the deep earth magic that you can just pretend is in there and, and not need to know the logistics. If you wanted to learn more G-code, you totally can, but it is in no, like for this course, and I would say for a long, long time as a maker, you would not need to know how to read or interpret G-code. Machinists are really good at it because they often make simple designs and need to make sure that their machines work really well uh, because they're working in metal and the stakes are kind of higher in the metal shop. And so the, the cost to having things go wrong or the, you know, there's, there's some details to that where a machinist whose full job is to run a CNC, they might want to know some G-code commands. But for us, they're going to be things that are handled for us, which is great, actually. Uh, but we're going to see that this very old language that started in the 50s is when it started showing up, is gonna become a recurring theme. It's what runs the 3D printer. It's also what runs the water jet, the end mills of a CNC, the laser is run by G-code, the vinyl cutter is run by G-code and like a hot wire cut. There's all sorts of things that are run by G-code. And we'll even be working with G-code later uh, using Gerbil, which is a, a system you can upload onto an Arduino and then it knows how to res respond to G-code commands. So we're going to play around with G-code, but it's something that's just going to be spit out by a slicer for us mostly. So what, what do you do? If those are just sort of conceptual background pieces that I think are worth it to look at um, and to try and understand a little bit better. But now there's some, some cool advanced 3D printing tricks. Let's see, pulling up the chat. Um, whoop, back into here. Chat. My chat is gone. I don't know where the chat is. The question was, what was it used for in the 1950s? Oh, the same exact thing. Really largely hasn't changed. It was for CNC back at the back in the 50s, and it's continued on that entire time, just running the simplest of machine movements. The files would have been way smaller. It would have been much, much less. Uh, but I think that in the 50s, it was still doing similar sorts of things, moving, moving end mills with motors and, and doing the same sort of machining. It would have been far more rare. As the computing power has gotten cheaper, CNCs have really proliferated, and it's why we see people able to play around with them like we do now. Like the first commercial 3D, the first like desktop 3D printers were things that were commonly made in garages and maker spaces. Uh, MakerBot started in New York City, I think, with just a team of three people in a place pretty analogous to Make Haven. So as computing power has gotten cheaper and cheaper, th this has expanded quite a bit. And hopefully by the end of the course, we'll be building some things that interpret G-code ourselves. So that's, that's exciting. <laughs> Next up, though, these advanced 3D printing tricks, there's several. And one of them, I put out a video this week because um, it was yesterday I was at Makehaven. And it turns out that you can get to Octopi from any computer attached to the Makehaven Wi-Fi. So if you're on your own laptop in Makehaven, all you need to do is type in octopi, the number dot Makehaven, and you can pull up your octopi interface to print from any computer. So if you bring your own laptop into Makehaven and you have a 3D design that you'd like to print, you don't have to put it onto a flash drive. You don't have to carry it around. You can just upload it from your computer directly onto the Raspberry Pi. 
And this is really due to the secret uh, magic of Octopi being something run as a server or as a service, a web app that's being run off of Raspberry Pis right next to those 3D printers. It's a really cool way to use a web app. Um, it's actually not too dissimilar from other web app things that we've done or that I've built and hopefully that we'll be able to play with when we get to some of those later units. This is, it's using a little Flask server. So you can go to this website that's hosted by the Raspberry Pi and that's what's in control of the 3D printer. It's a really neat thing. If you just use the computer that's right by it, it's totally possible, but you're gonna wanna make sure that you pay attention to the URL because the number here is, is basically deciding what printer you're printing to. So that's a cool thing. There's also a bunch of settings and largely I would say leave them with the default. Another thing that maybe has made it, didn't, whoop, didn't quite make it in here is I would totally recommend that you get yourself a slicer or something installed on your computer. You can slice your own files before you get to Octopi. There's a slicer that's in there, but you can also have your own G code and upload that directly. So in here, I was working with Kate actually, and Kate was able to send over an STL through Slack. And then I could upload it from my laptop into Octopi. And then we tried a few different slicers. So there's, there's some irregularity in the slicers on a Raspberry Pi. It may be worth it to get a slicer like Cura or the slicer with a, a three as a an E is a three on that name so that you have exactly what you want. And I, let's see if I have it. Nope, that's the wrong slicer. Um, so slicer, I think I have installed on my laptop from this week, but uh, in there, you can slice up your files however you want. And that'll take you from STLs to G code and then upload the G code directly to the, to Octopi. Another thing that's really helpful if or you're 3D you printing. More questions in the chat. Can you get to it or do you want me to read them? I don't know why I can't see them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I could just say my question. Um, so yeah. the different slicers that we can use, what is the, like, how different is my file gonna be depending on like which slicer I use? How, how much does that vary? Um, it, I would say it doesn't vary by giant amounts and it should give you similar G code based on whichever one you're doing. And so I'm, I'm downloading these right now, even though they might be downloaded somewhere. But in, in these different slicers, oh, I definitely downloaded that. So like here's Cura. I'm gonna install Cura right while we're on this call. But these slicers should be able to take your STLs and turn them into, oh, okay. All right, apparently I have Cura. So these slicers should be able to take STLs that you have and then split them up into G code. It, it may not be a big difference, but the Ultimaker Cura versus the Cura that's on the Octopi is a, that one's name is Legacy Cura. So I don't know how that would be different, like in what an important way, but the fact that it's legacy makes me think that it's probably an older version that may not be the, the best version of what it could be. Um, I will, I'll just add from my experience that, so when my file wouldn't slice in Octopi, I just assumed it was me because I'm new to making SDLs and I assumed my file was somehow wrong. Um, and when I trouble, did troubleshooting with Corey, I was able to use other programs and see that it did slice and actually, um, so that could help me figure out where the problem was, that it wasn't actually the file and that I could slice it and upload the G code or use a different slicer to get it there. Um, mm -hmm. So even from a basic level, just knowing that that's an option that you have um, was helpful. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you're ever stuck, try another one. It's. Can I ask a stupid question? Sure. So just to make sure I understand. So it starts off as an STL file and that's triangles, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And then you use a slicer to get it into G code and G code is like coordinates of those triangles essentially like layering out and mapping out those triangles? Uh, largely, yes. Okay. So it, it's um, when, you, when you take this and I say uh, for here, make 3D print, I can open up, save as an STL. So this is an interesting thing. I can grab in here and say, I'd like to preview the mesh on this particular part. If I go to this body and say preview mesh, I don't want to send it to a print utility. 
what it should be able to do is show me on the desktop, we'll just say it's body two, but this ought to give me something that I can then upload into here. So it's going to grab, let's see, body two STL. So in here, this is all about my, this should be based around triangles. And so if I zoom in, you can start to see squares and triangles emerge on this geometry. And so there's lots of things that are going on there. If, as you're playing around, and boy, Cura is not my native one. Uh, but but as, you're, as you play around with these different designs, you can get this to slice, oh, here we go. I want it to rotate this way, 90 degrees. And so we can do that. This slicer will be able to take those designs and then as it slices through, I wanna do a preview of this. You can see that it's changed sort of the geometry to now it looks like a series of squished lines, right? And so this is able to go through and say that I have 52 layers and I can zoom down through and you can imagine those like tubular shapes are all directions that it's having the 3D printer head go, right? So those are all different locations and directions that it's gonna trace out. And any straight segment has got one G code command to make it happen. And any curve, each little segment of the curve has got a G code command for each one of those little segments. Mm -hmm. So ultimately you're going from the triangles and it needs to be an enclosed shape completely. It, the slicer processes that enclosed shape and turns it into a series of lines to trace out, which is, which is kind of amazing that it's all just magically done in that software. And then there's settings for like, that's not very full. I could play around with my infill settings in Cura to make that happen. Although I would need to you figure out where that is in this particular interface, but that's, that's, totally what you're doing every time that you slice. Another thing that's neat is that you can choose how many different external layers there are. So like in here, you can see there's maybe about two layers of thickness on the edges of this shape. And so you can adjust that to more or less if you wanna have it be thicker and sturdier, or if you want it to be completely solid inside. I would say that most of the time when I print things, they're not completely solid. You usually don't need that much strength. Most, most items need their strength right on the edges rather than in the middle. So those are all interesting ways that you can use a slicer like this one to take, a, to take your object and, and make it into a thing. This also is being printed on a raft, it looks like, just based on the fact that there's that plate there that it's sitting on. And so that raft is there to keep it so that it's attached to the bed, but maybe it would have a consistent look. Sometimes the, the face that's on a print bed gets to be flatter or shinier and, and people like or dislike that look. So those are all things to take into account. Um, let's see, we'll head back to here and keep going with some of these. Another thing that's really important to think about as you're building, and this is, we're not going to play this whole video. Um, but there's, it's important to think about the supports on a 3d print as you're 3d printing. There's some interesting dynamics to how it's going to work. And you can see sort of breakaway parts on this particular design. These look like they're modeled in directly. And you can imagine sort of the G code to make the extrusions happen and to make motion happen. But if you're building something and you're designing it and printing it, you're going to need supports to hold up anything that's overhanging. So like the, the nose of this dog figure, which is maybe Anubis, I think. Uh, but the nose of that dog figure would need to be held up by something. And so you can either have very targeted designs or you can have these sort of rectangular designs. There's a lot of waste in those rectangular designs and they take a while, but they always work for whatever geometry you're going to do. They work really nicely. They, they don't take a lot of configuration. They just sort of happen, but you can totally plan out exactly how you want your supports to work and where you'd like them to be. And you can also make sure that your designs are just built in such a way that if you have angles that aren't very steep, you may not even need, uh, you may not even need supports. And so a lot of people who are experienced with this, they want to make sure that their print times are as low as they can be. And they want to waste as little material as possible. So they'll do design things. If it, if it's no difference one way or the other, and you can design in such a way that it would print without supports, there's lots of people that will just opt to do that. And so um, oh. with that print, why wouldn't you just like rotate it at 90 degrees so that it was laying on its back or something like that? That, that is a good question. And I think for this design, 
just seeing them rotate around it. It looks like they want to detail on all the sides. The bottom of this guy looks like it would sit flat on a table. And so my guess is that they want it to be attached there. You also okay. probably want to have, when you're printing, you also want to have a fair amount of surface on the bed because that's your connection point that holds it all together. So that that's what attaches it or adheres it to the print bed. And as it's wiggling around the print bed, that's going to be where it may shake off and kick off the bed. And I've definitely had parts that just get kicked off the bed because they wiggle around too much and they don't have a good connection. So having a big flat base like the pedestal on the bottom of this guy is probably why they wanted him printed up. And, and it would probably disrupt the nature of his back would be my guess. But it, it makes sense if you brought, if like his back didn't matter that much, you could tilt him back and you'd have a big flat surface if you wanted to mount him on a wall instead of sitting up on a floor. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it's all like the detail that you want to have in your design. Um, with that, there's also plenty of things to think about for infill and shells. And so infills and shells are definitely part of the language that comes along with 3D prints. The infill is the amount that was filled. And so in Cura, my infill is pretty low. In here, maybe 10%, because uh, it's not taking up much of the volume inside of there. But you can imagine 100% infill, you're going to have lines that go back and forth and completely fill the volume of the object. Most of the time, there's not actually a giant strength increase once you pass about 70. Uh, for the things that I've built and, and the context that I'm in, I can imagine if you're putting a part under tension, you may want 100%. But if you're under compression forces, usually you cap out at a useful maximum of about 70 with diminishing returns afterwards. Shells are probably more where it's at if you want to get stronger. So shells are how many layers on the outside edge you have. From Cura, you can see that I have two, two shells here. And so one and two are sort of a small range. One, two, and three are kind of normal. Uh, four, five, and, four or five and 10, you're getting into the stronger shell levels. And you may not need that many for most prints. I'd say stick in the two to three range for most of your prints and you'll be good to go. There's also interesting vase mode. Um, not so much, well, I don't know if Cura or Slicer have it but Simplify 3D, which is another slicer option, has a vase mode where you plop in a 3D design, say, I would like this to be the top of my vase, and then it just prints the whole thing as one shell with no infill. So it turns pretty much any geometry you can come up with immediately into a vase for you right there in the slicer, which is nicer than having to design in and then guess the geometry or the thickness that you'd need to have your wall be. It can do that for you right away in the slicer. All you have to input is the exterior geometry you'd like your vase to have. So that's a neat feature on some slicers. But how can you actually make prints stronger is a really good question. So how beyond thinking about your infill and your shells, there's a few different features that you can think about to try and make prints stronger. Like if you wanna have a protruding cylinder come off of a print, a good trick that, you can, that you'll learn over time is that if you have a, a, a fillet along the edge here where this sort of softly goes into the side, that's a lot more printed area that's in contact when you get to that junction between the column and the flat area. So there's a lot more strength there because you've got more connection points. As opposed to this, where there's a sharp edge here, you're basically only connecting right around this edge, especially if you've got a low infill and only a couple layers of, of uh, the shell because then you might just have two layers that are really in contact there. Whereas here, you're gonna have a whole progression of layers and this would be much stronger. So it doesn't need to be a big, um, a big fillet when you're doing this. You can, you can totally make it an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, something very, very tiny. Uh, it doesn't need to be a lot for you to have a really pronounced increase in strength if you find that you're printing things with like little dowel-like shapes hanging off of them. Hey, Corey, a uh, quick question. Yeah. Uh, do we have like different um, nozzle sizes for the 3D printers? Uh, I don't want to do layup or can we? I, uh, that's, that's a good question. And the short answer is I, I'm not sure. Uh, My guess is that they're probably all the same because then you don't have to think about what filament you're putting on. And so it's, it's probably easier from a, a switch in and switch out thing, but that'd be a good question for a facilitator. I think okay. though that they're, that they're all the same. All right. Thanks. Yeah.
Um, but one thing you can do is adjust your Z height. So depending on how long the same size print nozzle sits in an area, you can have it ooze out more stuff. So this is a picture of a slightly larger nozzle, but with a really slow travel rate and a large extrusion rate. So this gives thicker Z height layers, and that can be a way to add some strength to a model. Um, but you definitely want to think about the orientation of a model as you're printing it. The Z axis on a 3D printer is the weirdest one of them. It's got the lowest resolution and every so often things will go wrong. Uh, the Z axis, you can see this little zoom in that it may not behave consistently as it goes up. The, the motors that make the motions happen are pretty accurate in the X and Y for the horizontal mov movements, but all of the vertical movements are going to be the least accurate of those. And then in some cases, your X and Y, if your Z axis is wonky, it may lead to problems. This is when your levels shifted. So here your Z is doing its thing. And then all of a sudden mid through, when way through the print, maybe something bumps the 3D printer. This is the only real failure mode that you often get from the X and Y axis where you just have a print that's shifted off to one side, but otherwise it continues up completely normal. And that usually happens because the G code tells the printer where to go, but it has no consciousness as to whether it gets bumped or not. So if like someone's walking through Make Haven and they happen to bump it in just a way that the motor gets kicked over by this, like, I don't know, maybe quarter of an inch there, it'll continue on happily to do all the rest of your G code and have no idea that it's off target. So that's an interesting, this is a level, a layer shift. And it can be really bad if your settings are off or it can be just like a one-time thing that happens from a brownout in power to somebody walks by and bumps the table real hard. So these are interesting ways, interesting things to think about. This hopefully doesn't happen very often for the printers at Makehaven. And this I hope happens even less. This is just an annoying problem to have. It really takes a lot of fine tuning to get that up and running. If you notice something like these two problems, that's a good one to talk to a facilitator about for sure. But those are, those are things where if you know, if you suspect that you're ever going to have a problem, it's going to be in, in those layers that come as you move up along the Z axis, that's going to be always your weakest point. And even if it's not uh, a, a weird level shift like that, you can rearrange if you're building a bracket or something that needs some strength, you may want to think about rearranging it so that those vertical stripes are in your part the way that you wouldn't mind it. Uh, and that's that's definitely a tricky thing. So if you're 3D printing shelf brackets, which is probably not a good starter project, sort of like sewing your own parachute or those sorts of things, put it in that camp of not a good starter project for 3D printed items. Corey? Yeah. Um, just a quick question about um, fish scaling. Oh yeah. Um, is there like the way to address that? Is that in the slicer or is that in the design itself. Like this this sort of weird look along the edge. There's a few names for that. Yeah, I've I've I'm not sure if that's exactly what it is, but I've heard that like fish scaling is sometimes happens when like um the 3D printer can't read your code properly. Hmm. There's yeah, the if you're seeing fish scaling, it's always good to try another slicer. And so let's look it up exactly fish scaling on 3D printer. Hmm. Now that's probably not what you were talking about. <laughs> no. <laughs> Those are actually lovely. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it depends on what your failure modes are. It's what I've often found is that there's a few main reasons that you might have a problem with a print. And it could be that your slicer, you just try another slicer and you'll have better luck. Or the other one is that if the nozzle is partially clogged on a printer, you uh, it'll change the dynamic of how it comes out of the printer. And so it's something I, I've used cleaning filament a few times and I talked to Lior about getting a roll. It's a thing that you can pass through and it sort of cleans out the old plastic in a nozzle. It's not an all the time sort of solution. Like most of the time a, a printer will be fine without it. But if you notice that, if you notice some sort of oddity that seems to be outside of your control on a 3D printer. This is the sort of thing that the, the facilitators love to talk about, actually. It, there's, there's like a whole category of people that love talking about 3D printing all of the time. 
And I'm confident that our facilitators for the 3D printer area are totally some of those people. So I would completely ask them. They might know exactly the solution. Whereas I'm able to 3D print, but every detail on all of the little failure modes are not always my, my biggest cup of tea. But one of the things that's really cool about 3D printing is that it, it is expanding. So it used to be that the 3D printers like our in Make Haven were the only show in town, which is still really a great thing, but increasingly dual printers and the resin printers that are in Make Haven are becoming more and more popular and accessible. This is a Maker Gear dual, independent dual extruder where you can print two colors in the same print. And this frog is a good example of printing yellow and black. And you get this lovely design all in one 3D print. They're really cool. And then here's a, a copy of Benchy, a, a standard, that, that purple boat we saw, which is usually a good print test quality uh, printer, like stress test. This is a 2D color of Benchy. So you, you can have these designs that are multicolor and look really sharp. There's a, there's a ton of good sample prints to print in, on a dual color printer. Like there's a bunch of dragons with eggs and, and like eagles with colored wings. There's tons of weird ones that are fun to do. But you can also, when you start to have two printer materials, you can really introduce sort of accent pieces or accent colors. But there's also tons of different materials. Like there is flexible filament that you can print in. There's wood-like filament, glow in the dark, ultraviolet, reactive, conductive filament is a thing. Pet G where you anneal it in an oven afterwards. There's like bronzed color where there's like metal flex and dissolvable is a cool one. If you're really having problems with supports, dissolvable filament is a great solution where you can print something and the supports are printed in another material that when you put it in hot water, it just melts away. It's a slimy melts away, but it, it does actually work. And it's a really cool way to print really intricate things with dissolvable, with dissolvable filament. Also worth mentioning is that you could go to Shapeways to order things. Shapeways is, I would say, very expensive, um, but it's super high-end printing and you can print in really exotic materials that you wouldn't be able to get to normally. Like you can print in straight up metals, like print in stainless steel, print in uh, very high detail, print in all sorts of things. And they're actually located in New York. So they're New York and I think maybe Denmark is where they're from originally, but um, you can print in all sorts of crazy different things. There's 10 plus 3D printing technologies that they use. They use all sorts of different printers and they use printers that are far more expensive than the ones that we have at Make Haven. Like each printer is tens of thousands of dollars kinds of printers. So they've got tons of interesting capacity. And if you're way in the 3D printing realm, that's a neat way to go. But if you're trying to get that deep, it's also worth it to think about like, what would you want to print or how do you want to bring in ideas? And since you can print from any STL, we should talk about 3D scanning, sort of the other half of this. 3D scanning has a few core technologies and the first of them and the one that's most accessible is photogrammetry. And so here's a little 3D scan of my own head uh, that was then 3D printed. This is totally something that you can do with an app like Scan3D. And so photogrammetry is a process where you take a whole collection of pictures and then from that you can build a 3D model. It's the technology that's at the core of the 3D view in Google Maps where they take, they do flyovers and get pictures of towns like New Haven. And then because all of those pictures are at slightly different angles, they can have an algorithm stitch them together and it will build out the 3D geometry of the area, which is really fascinating. Or if you wanna have a highly detailed computer model for like a video game or a character in a game, you might put them into a photo box like this where you get all sorts of detailed angles from the sides so that you can capture every little detail to recreate them for a game or for a movie. So there's all sorts of ways that you can use photogrammetry. And basically all it's doing is it's finding the edges between a series of photos. There's a ton of good information about it. And actually Argisoft has some really good explanations for how this works, but it's a cool way to explore it. This is like, a, I would consider this an optional thing, but it's really cool. You can, uh, Carolyn wanted me to turn my head into a, a planter. I never did it, but I, I totally should. I should figure out how to chop a hole in the back of my head here and like put a plant in it. That would be fun. Um, there are the Recapture Pro. So if you have a, 
Recapture Pro is a Autodesk software that will do this. Argisoft is a paid service and Visual SFM is, is a free one. Scan3D is a phone app. There used to be one, two, 3D catch, which was a free software as well. There's these sort of pop in and out of existence photogrammetry apps, because it turns out they're pretty profitable. So people will make them free and you can get the app and play with it for a while. And then once they realize how to monetize it, they usually pop into a paid model. So if you find an app like this that you like, it's worth it to have it loaded on your device and then never ever let it go. Also some of the lower tier 3D scanners that you can buy that are dedicated devices, and there might be one rolling around at Make Haven, they use this process usually. But if they don't, here's another way that you can do 3D scanning which is with structured light and stereoscopic 3D scanning. So these are cameras and projectors put together. They project these striped lines onto objects. And when, you're, when you have these striped lines projected, this is a butterfly, I think, and maybe a, a fitting for an engine part, or I don't know what that is, some sort of a armored thing, but you project these lines on it and the camera, which is slightly offset from the projector, can take pictures and based on the structure and deviations in those lines, because you'd expect a certain projection angle, you can interpret what the geometry is. This is one level up on 3D scanning from photogrammetry because you're sort of manufacturing all of the surfaces. Details that are a little bit finer than photogrammetry could pick up, you can totally get from structured light. And then oftentimes you'll get these USB turntables where it slowly turns the object while it's shining light on it. There was a, a whole series of open source 3D scanners based around an Xbox Connect back in the back in that time frame where you could get that viewer to, to shine light. You could have light be shine on things and then rotate it very carefully. So you can totally build your own 3D scanner. It would be a fun Make Haven project to do, but it's a neat way to scan things in and to play around. Or we actually build have one of those. Oh, you do? We have the uh, 3D turntable and an Xbox Connect. We've scanned full people with it. It's over in the uh, 3D printing area. All, all right, so we should try it. Somebody, we should figure out a way and a time to make that happen so that you can all turn your own heads into planters. That sounds great. <laughs> uh, and then the last scanning technology that's worth doing is talking about is LiDAR scanning. And if you have an iPad Pro, one of the new ones, this will probably be just part of your iPad Pro. And so you can use this to scan things. And this is a really interesting, it's probably the highest level of these. This is the sort of thing that shows up on self-driving cars where they scan using lasers what's around and based on how long it takes for that laser beam to come back, they can, they can estimate what's going on. For the iPad Pro, it also takes pictures at the same time. And so you can get these really crazy uh, 3D models. And I hope that this takes me to the right spot for canvas. Oh, I want to go, this is for occipital ink. Let's see if we can find, nope, wrong, wrong thing. Here it is for the iPad. And so developer's website, that's what I want. So here's, nope, not what I was hoping for. Uh, so inside of, I need to find the right link, but inside of canvas, you can play around and scan rooms. This is really helpful for people who are doing remodeling to be able to scan a room instead of take a whole ton of measurements. You can walk in and sort of point the camera around in different directions and it'll collect color and sizes and distances. And the, the use case that they give in their example is to have this for scanning a room for doing remodeling. And it, it works amazingly well from their tech demonstrations. I have not gotten to play with it, but it seems like a neat add-on this was, used to be a, a thing that you had to physically add, but since then the iPad Pro has added in the scanner as a native part of the object, as the part of the device. So it's a lot uh, more accurate you get by just doing the tape measure, or well, maybe not more accurate, but it's a lot faster. And so it's a neat way to understand what's going on. And you can see sort of these models to play around with, like here's one of them. You can totally, like I'm able to click and drag this around. There's, there's some artifacts, it's not like it's perfect, but boy, that's a cool trick to be able to do to your room. If you want to imagine what's going on to be able to say like, oh, replace all the yellow color with red to see what a red chair would be like, would be a lot of fun. You can even zoom way in and, and take a look. There's, there's a ton of neat options for this as a technology. So LiDAR scanning has only recently become available. It used to be a big research item, 
they actually found a giant um, Maya town that was hidden in the Amazon jungle by doing LIDAR flyovers of the jungle to see what was under the canopy. And so here's a large, the like printout of a large structure and I've got a link to it right here, but there's all sorts of different interesting things that LIDAR has been used for. And it's a really neat option. But 3D scanning is its own category. It always puts out an STL and it's very hard to modify STLs unless you're good at modeling with a 3D mesh, which is not really my cup of tea. But it's totally a thing that you can go after if you wanted to nudge those shapes into exactly what you wanted them to look like. But what I really wanna talk about is two and a half D construction. And for this, I really strongly recommend that you get this app called Slicer. And this is more of a, I'm, I'm completely a fanboy of this one more than anything else. Slicer for Fusion 360 is unsupported. They're not making updates to it and you have to sort of find your way around, but there's the link to get to it. And this is a really neat app that will let you take a design like a, a 3D model of a Rhino head and it'll turn it into a series of stack slices and then give you cut list instructions for how to make that thing. So you can completely build it and it does all of that geometry work for you. I'm so fascinated by it that I actually, um, I wanted to find, here's, here's an example of a bench that I modeled. And this is just a screenshot of it. Cause when you open Slicer for Fusion 360, it, it actually crashes Fusion 360, which is probably why it's unsupported right now. But you know, it's still great. Um, this is a bench that I designed and those are all slices that are the exact width of plywood. So I could go through and design this for a series of plywood things. So this is very much like Ada's um, furniture that she was that she's building. And so it's a really cool option. It's not nearly as configurable as doing it by hand, but it's a really cool process that you can design these things. Uh, and all I had to input to this software is an STL and it would spit out all of these designs for me. So it's a really cool app to give a try. But Slicer is, is really cool. These are sort of the instructions. You export an STL to Slicer and then you can play with all these configurations and get the cut lists out. If you do this by hand, and I think Slicer is great. It's a really good place to get the idea for how to do this and to see sort of the best practices. But from there, then it's really helpful to make your own things. And so how do you, you do that by exporting DXFs to go from 3D to 2D? Ah, oh. hmm. reload. So if, interesting, I'll have to see what's going on with that. Okay, it didn't load, but we're gonna just look at it here. If you have a design, like in this case, I've got a design of a circular thing with a few other circles around it, maybe an adapter or something. If you wanna export a DXF in Fusion 360, you're gonna to need to right click on a sketch and then save as DXF. And then those vectors can be used in all sorts of vector software. And so I've used them for all sorts of things. When you specifically design the geometry that you wanna have exported, I've used them to make stools exactly like what was in the, in the tutorial that I made earlier to make enclosures for electronics. Here's a table that I made from a 3D design. Here's a cart that was designed this way. And then we exported all of those different faces as DXFs and then used it to cut out shapes on a CNC. Same deal for this cello thing. And then here's that car back again from the top of the slides where this was, instead of, these are all sort of CNC examples, except for this one was cut on the laser out of cardboard. And this one was the laser for thin, thin plywood. So you can totally do this if you're building and it's a really helpful way to build in, in a 3D design software where you know that you wanna cut it out of a material that isn't 3D printed. It takes a long time to really get at the design parts of this. And I would say that it's as deep of a wormhole as like woodworking joinery to think about the CNC joinery and how do you design for this. There's tons and tons of things, but if you can start to wade into this pool you get to have tons more options than just 3D printing your designs where you can make them out of all sorts of different materials. So it's a really cool way to do it. This table, by the way, uh, was it all fit on one sheet of plywood. So that's like a $35 table because of one sheet of plywood. And it was a cut that took 15 to 20 minutes. So one sheet of plywood in 15 minutes and you've got a table that pops right off the machine. 
So depending on how you want to do it, you can really make some interesting things uh, and, and have lots more options than just 3D printing what you've 3D designed. But this takes years of practice to get to that point. So you know, take that in mind. And so then what's next? Um, the things that I really would encourage you to do this week is to make sure that you have your Fusion 360 installed. I would really encourage you to try Slicer for Fusion. It's totally weird. It will crash Fusion 360 when you open it. It's, it is awkward, don't get me wrong. And if you don't, I'll, I'll make a video of that happening and upload it today or tomorrow. Uh, but it's fun to try and to see how those things are put together. If we make it through a little bit of time with Fusion here, maybe I'll even open it on my computer right now. But then I would say build something from a simple geometric shape. And so find a small shape that you like, and then you can build it a few different ways, maybe with uh, cardboard or with the map board that's in Makehaven. There's lots of options, but give those things a try and sort of see how to push yourself. Or you can just keep playing in Fusion because there's lots of layers to unpack there. So now I think it's, it would be good for us to take, that's our last slide and we're, we're kind of at time, but I wanted to play around with Fusion 360 and just open this up and see, oh, there was my, if there was the chat, just pop back into existence. Okay, so we're gonna hop into Fusion 360 and take a look at like this design. So this is something that I, there's, there's tons of different things. What would be really helpful is if you guys have any questions specifically about Fusion 360 that we can address, I would love to address those. I can also just sort of roll around through designs and show you how I made things. Um, like in here, if we make sketches and these things available. This is, I just drew a little, I don't know, triangle sort of thing like that and rotated it into existence with a revolve. And then from there, I did a circular array. So I took that geometry and I said, I wanted to rotate it around the red axis, which is the X axis, I guess. And so it went from being one to being six of them. And then it was six separate bodies. So this is a thing that can get people. These are overlapping bodies that are not joined together. And so all I did was said, I wanna make a sketch right in the middle. This is my sketch two, I'll hide sketch one so that it's not visible. But that sketch is really just a circle in the middle of nothing. And then I extruded it just a little bit so that those would all be joined together. So if I hit the edit feature here, this is, let me change my settings so that my, you can see all my things a little bit better. Uh, this is set to join. So when I do this, I hit join and it, it's going to bring those six separate objects together so that you can see I've got all these different bodies that exist in this design right now. And you hit join and boom, they pop together into one thing because that cylinder touched all six of them and it joined them into one singular body. Corey, I don't know if this is a realistic request. Um, sure. When we talk about it, it sounds like you can make that thing pretty quickly. Um, and if that is the case, I'm wondering if you could like make it from a new document. Totally, and here we go. Pieces. Yep. This is totally, totally reasonable. So let's go in. I'm just gonna like grab a dimension and let's see, I think I drew it with a line here and then a line here. And I'm using L for the line tool. And, and those are hotkeys that I just have memorized from years of playing this game. And so all I'm doing is, is grabbing tools that I've, that I've got at my disposal. Like the arc tool is gonna be useful. I'm gonna do an arc from here to here. And so the arc tool is a good example of one that's tricky and like you just have to play with it enough to learn how it works. What I laid down was the first click is the first side of the arc. The second click is the second side of the arc. And then the third click is where you want your arc to be shaped. And that's totally like not intuitive. There's no good reason why it is that way, but it's just one of the things that you learn. And so I popped it into existence. You can see I was choosing between constraints right there. So as I draw in this and this, saying that I want it to be joined, you can see that little blue symbol that's the constraint symbol. So do I want it to be tangent to that or do I want it to be tangent to this? And just sort of playing around, I can look and see how it's popping into existence. Like those horizontal lines are letting me constrain my motion a little bit easier vertically. Those are all interesting little details and my, 
I'm just playing with the mouse, but I can do that. And then if I wanna grab this and make it tangent, I'm gonna grab the arc, which is importantly not the center. If I grab the center of that circle, I don't have tangent, but if I grab the arc part, there's the tangent tool. Those contextual menus really throw people when they're new to Fusion. But I can do this and say that I'd like that to be tangent also. So that if I wanted that, I could do exactly this, play, play around with it. I'm gonna leave it where it was. And then next up, whoops, I wanna do another line tool. So I can go from this point down here up to there and we'll bring it all the way up. I'll even do extend is a fun tool where you can extend this out and it'll go out to the next piece of the geometry. And then I just hit finish sketch. Then I can revolve and like grab that section. And so this is my profile. It's just that half of a, whatever you'd call this shape, half of the cone. And then I'll select the line as my center of rotation. So there is the like cylinder piece, maybe one petal of the flower if we're imagining it's a flower. And so I'll do that and say, okay. And that just pops into existence. Gordon, am I right that um, sort of one of the key pieces, at least that I feel like I would have missed in, in making this is when you have that, that shape, that two dimensional shape, cutting it in half so that you could rotate around the center is how you really- Yes, and, and cutting it in half, point. There's, if I didn't cut it in half, it would have been, so let's go back in and edit this sketch. You're totally right. And that's the thing that if, if I don't, if I finish the sketch like it is and I hit rotate, I won't, one, I'm, I may not have an axis to rotate it on, but if I control Z and put it back and take that and hit X to turn it into a construction line. And now I try and revolve it around the construction line because it's it would like bring itself into and out of existence. So the axis of rotation is not going to ever resolve into something. So it because it isn't bisected, that's just not going to work. I could rotate it. I could do a revolve with this and then choose maybe this is my rotation axis. And then because that's a contiguous shape that's enclosed, I can rotate it. So I get this slightly goofier shape, which is kind of fun. I think I'm going to stick with it. Uh, and so I've got this, this shape, I'm just going to hit okay. And that has popped into existence and I can see that like, it's, it's sort of weird. Right. But then a cool tool from there is the, there are all of these create options, like create pattern. You can usually get to really cool things by just doing circular patterns. And so I'm going to grab a body. I know that that thing's a body. And so I want to grab it as a body. So like here, I've just grabbed it. And then the axis that I'm gonna choose, when I clicked select axis, it brought my, uh, my main origin axis back into view. So this is the origin that's here for the whole document. I can bring this into or out of view. And sometimes I'll even pop bodies out of existence so that I don't have to worry about clicking through them. And I can either choose this red one here or by choosing it up over here to choose as my axis of rotation. And so I've got some options to do that way where I can, I can make this triple donut thing and I can change how many donuts there are. Right, let's go with four. And so then here I've got a weird four donut game that looks like a, a fun thing to see on a breakfast table. But um, this, is, this is totally like a, a start, but you can see that I've got the same problem as I had before. There's four bodies. And from there, in order to join them, I'm just gonna do another sketch so like I'll grab this surface uh, and maybe make an offset plane, which is just like a, all I'm doing is taking that surface that was right on that green line and I can make an offset plane like this. So I'll do that and just play, plop it in there. That's then a construction plane down here and I'll use that. So I've got it highlighted in blue. I'll do that and hit sketch. So I'm sketching on that construction plane. So even though it looks like I'm sketching on a surface, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer because the, the, the grid is sort of bisecting the material. It's in the middle of the grid right on that construction plane. So then I can draw in a circle. And if I grab that circle, let's hide all these bodies, do this and extrude just a little bit. All I'm gonna do is extrude this teeny tiny bit and instead of cut, I'll do join. And it'll join all four of those things together and now I go down back to one body again. 
so yeah, that's the, that's that whole thing to make the flour or pile of donuts. It's, it's a, it, and I a hundred percent can imagine it would be frustrating to watch me do that because it's a whole collection of years of experience. And when it's your first week, you've got to be okay with yourself fumbling through it and knowing that it's a long time. Uh, it was before we started class officially. I said that I used to teach right next to a guy who taught a CAD program at the high school where I was at. He taught a two year long program where you spent half your day with him and they would cover one and a half CAD softwares. Like this is not something that you can pick up in a week. It is not something that you pick up quickly, but you can, you can definitely go around relatively fast. Like a good example of how you'd build something faster would be if you're not trying to build something parametric. And so that was an example. I wasn't trying to build in any parameters, but you can just go through and like do, this is what a freshman will do if they're trying to, a freshman in high school would do if they're trying to build things. And there's nothing wrong with doing exactly this. So if you're trying to build a house, they would go through and they would draw one sketch that does one thing. And they just sort of go through and play this game until all of their dimensions are there and it's all set up. So you can do this and, and not even worry about what this is. It's a blind piece, but it goes right to the other end. And then if you want to put a door in this house, you come back over to the front and you draw a sketch. This is a totally valid way to draw things if you don't think that you're going to change around the parameters of it very much. So maybe you do this and then you can create a rectangular pattern of this guy, making a pattern that goes like that and then goes like this. And normally people like to have two in their windows. So I'll make this not as far apart, right? But this is already starting to look like window and door. And so a nice sketch like this has got no parameters, whoa, no constraints, something weird just happened. But in here, I can totally do this and make a pretty good representational model that comes together quickly. And so if you're, if the, the, I've got something going on on my screen, but the, if you're trying to do 3D prints and you're just trying to do sort of artistic or visual ones that aren't trying to hit an engineering specification, this can be a really like helpful way to learn sort of what do the tools do? Like this would be a good moment to say, oh, I want a rounded roof for whatever reason. And so you grab all these things up here on the top and you can say, well, I'd like them to be round over by that much. And so this is just playing with the fillet tool that it's not got any, you know, this isn't trying to meet any specifications. It's not really doing anything particularly magical, but it's just a fun way to explore all those things without the, without hitting the burden of, of parameters. What's up, Kate? That felt really magical. <laughs> it happened <laughs> like that. Um, I have a really basic question that I've been fumbling with. Um, when I go to select my plane mm -hmm. um, and then I want to start a sketch, I basically just press L for a line tool because I don't know how else to start a sketch. I feel like sure. there's a button I'm missing or something. Yeah. Um, so if you want a new, so let's say your your brand new spot, all I do is create sketch here. And then you have to choose one of these three surfaces to use as your construction plane. So I usually choose the front for no good reason. And then you can choose any tool that you want, anything in the create tool. These are all your design options. So you can totally start off with an ellipse and say you'd like to draw an ellipse there. There's a few ellipse tools and I always lose track of them. I have to like try one. It, I can make things quickly, but it's usually because I've tried and then hit escape and back. Like control Z is completely my game in, in these design softwares. So like control Z, I didn't like that ellipse. Let's try the other ellipse tool or the other you know, polygon tool. There's a ton of different options. Where I'm, getting, where I'm getting stuck is once I already have an object and I'm like, mm -hmm. like, let's say we build the house and then I want to yeah. go back to the front and, and, and work on the door or something. Mm. Like I want to click on that plane right there. Once you click on it and it's highlighted, are you just? I just do create sketch. And when you do create sketch up in the top, this little like drawing with the green plus that create sketch button does a few things. It rotates my view so that I'm right on the surface and it captures the geometry there. Another good one that's really, really helpful is um, that's super useful actually is project. So let's say that I'm in here and I'm working on that door, but I'd also like to do things with these windows. 
the project tool will go in and it will collect all of the geometry of these shapes and bring them into your design. And so you can see they sort of blink red and I've got four selected. And if I hit okay, now those are purple lines. This, um, those purple lines are then collected into the sketch. So I can do different interesting things like maybe put in a doorknob and then these windows I can take and draw an offset. Um, offsets are really lovely also where you can take these and say, I'd like to do an offset on this and then make a sort of scaled window. This, and I have already forgotten how far I was going, but offsets like this can be really helpful. So there's, there's a lot of times where you'd wanna have a certain specific distance that you're away from your thing. And so these can be really useful. I think I used this in the, uh, to set up the tolerance distance on the stool. So if you watch that video, you can, you can totally play around with that. But then I do that and I, I just hit the body. You can bring it back. And then these guys, we can extrude back into existence a little bit. Anything else? There's a ton of weird things that have probably happened to you this week that are worth identifying and talking about. All right. Um, yeah. Do you mind if I tell them some things that came up with me after sure. like hours of doing this um, and even doing a tutorial just on constraints? Um, it was probably a couple of hours ago. I was telling Corey, I, you know, I can't do something you're doing in this tutorial. And uh, it was a constraint thing. And I realized all I had to do was hit escape. So Mm -hmm. There are times where you might want to uh, align something, like get it centered or um, use one constraint and then use the tangent with like a circle and a line and it won't snap to or the other, all the um, constraints will be grayed out except for the lock. So sometimes you either have to just hit escape um, for whatever reason or once you have that constraint, like once it's snapped uh, in place and you've gotten the use of that constraint, erase it, like highlight that constraint setting, like mm -hmm. right where that circle is, like that, that tangent symbol or whatever symbol comes up, erase it. And then you can um, use whatever constraint you want. So that was something that just wasn't intuitive until I did. Yeah, the constraints like popping into and out of existence is totally a useful thing. And, and there's, there's not a lot of logic to like how things will move when they're not constrained. Like this is already the funnest, weirdest geometry game I'm playing. But, there's, but learning how the constraints work is definitely something that can be really helpful as you get better. But it's not an exact science. Um, and you're, you're totally right, Jamie, that like sometimes popping them in and out is the best way to make it happen. Hitting escape, deleting things, putting them back. Um, I wish it was, there's, there's um, some level of sensibility to them, but then there's also plenty of weirdness that happens. So it's a good thing to play around with. I also found that there were times I just needed to save and then, um, cause the computer was just doing buggy things. So I would just quit, um, make a cup of tea, come back, open it up and it would be fine. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, I think that also it's worth noting that Fusion 360 is like transitioning to be Autodesk's primary uh, flagship design software. It's not, it, it hasn't, I've never seen anyone say like, this is it, but it's, it's on its way. So it's still got bugs that they're working on. What's up? I thought I heard a question. Nope. It's 8.08, I would love to do show and tell if we don't wanna watch any other weirdness with Fusion 360. Let's see. Uh, I know that many of you have built cool stuff. Can we, does um, anybody have anything cool to share? Like Jamie, you're unmuted. You wanna tell us about what you were up to this week? Um, sure, well, this week I really want to just focus on um, Fusion 360, because I've been wanting to learn a 3D program since I just kind of gave it up in college and 
you know, I went through the class and was horrible at it and never picked it up again. Um, and so I wanted to give it another try because there's so many things I could do with it. Um, so I went through just tons of tutorials, um, struggled a lot. It was very frustrating, but then when I succeeded, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, your tutorials were really helpful. Like every tutorial, even the outdated ones, like I'll, if I get one thing from them, I'm happy. Um, so yeah, that's what I did. I did the dog house, um, pretty much finished with the bench. It's broken. So I'm like 10 minutes, um, away from finishing it. Um, but yeah. Um, and then I did not get to 3d badging this week just cause I'm just focusing on the program and trying to get down that down a little bit but I'd like to actually just now maybe play with it like you suggested mm -hmm. and um maybe even trying to incorporate what I do know and I'm comfortable with which is like Adobe so mm -hmm. going into Illustrator making some vectors dragging those in and seeing you know if that works um like a little bit better to like maybe do my sketches in there yeah and then yeah. extrude in yeah that's a really good point and i'm gonna i'm about to share my screen again um but there's totally a button for that in fusion 360 there's this in insert and then there's all sorts of options where you can insert an svg or a dxf so if you have an svg that you want to insert you can you can absolutely grab it from your from your computer and so i don't know if i have any but like this is how on the dust shoe i included the SVG that you had drawn, I put it in through this utility so that I could have it and like see what it looked like on the on the piece. And then once they're in, there's some scaling issues so that it's not completely smooth, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a cool way to play around with really complicated or detailed geometry that you've drawn in a software that's maybe easier to draw in in a particular way. And then you can bring it into here and use it for design work. Cool. Yeah. It's good, good to know. Mm -hmm. Another one that's really helpful is to insert a canvas, which is like, and actually the image for it is pretty good. Uh, if you insert a canvas, there's like a picture of a car. You can insert a flat picture and that's really helpful. I've done lots of scans of objects and then their two dimensional geometry from like a flatbed scanner on a computer is usually carried in. And if you can get it to come in at a one-to-one -one scale for size, then you can model the geometry like right on that flat surface in the 3D design software. So it's a really cool way to get particular geometry. I think it was, if I head back over to- Do you get chart. different orthographic views? Like, do you get the side, the front? Um, it's just the picture. The You're like putting a mm -hmm. picture in on its own sketch plane. Yes, but like, um, like, do you do just one picture and like choose one plane or do you do different views, like orthographic views of the, like the top, the, you know, like taking, you know, like six pictures of each side, top, bottom, left, right, front, back, and then um, bringing them into their own plane and then drawing off of that? Or do you just pick like, ha I've never even really explored that option. So what what's like one of the better ways of doing it? Yeah, you can hear, I'm trying to unsuppress that feature. Oh boy, is it gonna do it? Is it gonna view it? Um... Oh, it's giving me an error. But like this, to get that cello shape that was sort of reasonable, mm -hmm. oh, it popped into existence for a second there. This, this was a picture of a cello that we had imported. And so then from there, we were able to draw like on top of the cello shape, the oh, shape that we wanted right, it to right. be. So even though, I don't know why it's bugging out and not showing the picture, but you can see that purple area is where the cello would have been. Right. So we literally just drew it right on top and then use that center line as a mirror so we only had to draw half of it. We could just draw and, and duplicate. Cool. Yeah. Has anyone here tried um, using Illustrator or other programs and bringing it into Fusion 360? That's my uh, intention, but I haven't yeah, actually I, done it yet. Cool. I mean, I did yeah, I mean very... I've done a lot of that. Um, 
into in, into 360 a little bit but more into shaper 3d but it's the same principle mm -hmm. um yeah it works pretty well um it's definitely like when you're getting started on stuff it if, if you already know how to use vector illustrating software um it can really help you like get shapes down that you're gonna mm -hmm. that are actually gonna be helpful yeah um and generally speaking the drawing tools are better although sometimes i do choose to draw in shaper as opposed to illustrator or something because mm -hmm. um, sometimes just you know the constraining and in, in that sort of software is designed for 3d modeling so sometimes yeah. it's just a little more what i need mm -hmm. cool cool thank yeah, you there's, yeah there's all sorts of neat options for how to how to do this and how to build um let's see anybody else want to share ruby you want to show do you have the slug <laughs> yeah ruby you got the slug yeah. um hi grab I, something I, I have the slug um it's my technically my first 3d print um and it's a little flexi guy um i got badged in the 3d printer i think about a year ago and um it was too much for me at the time and so revisiting revisiting it i like basically just rewatched the video and then kind of slowly took it in um so I just pulled this off of Thingiverse and I'm really happy with how it came out. Um, I used like a 20% infill and um, I went off of like all of their like suggested settings. And like, I noticed what, what I didn't know is that um, once you like get to the space um, in, well, I was using the computer that was already there. Um, in Octoprint, there are like auto like suggested like settings for the heat for the tool and the tool itself, the nozzle and the bed, which I found really um, helpful. So I did that. Um, and yeah, it, it was great. It's a good first starter project. Um, and I think um, this would be cool to use uh, to 3D print something before like going further with like a CNC, like the, the future, whatever, but um, yeah, and then, oh my God, I also wanted to say, um, I presented my cloud lamp to the clinic and they loved it. And so I'm gonna be making a bunch of those for the clinic and I'm so excited. And I just wanted to share that with you guys because I kind of, this the, that lamp was sort of born in this. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we're so excited for you, Ruby. That's so cool. <laughs> There's, uh, and I love that you've got, that the example that you picked was a, a print in place item that that little guy printed out all in one shot and then he's wiggly that like they they loop together and then yeah. you can just flop them all around. I love print, this. Yeah. Print in place is like one of the cool, it's one of the cool tricks of 3D printing where you can get, um, where you can get things that, that latch together and they work really nicely that way. It's an awesome one. Oh, and then Kate, you want to share what your what your little print in place friend was? Uh, this is just actually um, my my son's. I'm gonna put you on camera if you keep talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is one we've had in our house for a while. This is the the llama he named Dolly, of course. So we have Dolly Llama here. <laughs> um, but that was from from the past. I can show you. Um, I think I can share my screen and talk about. Oh, but before I do that. One thing, if you if you haven't seen on the foundations oh. chat, I'm asking for pictures um, for the um, annual meeting, which is Thursday, and you all should come. Um, and Ruby, it would be super cool to include your cloud thing because that's like a really cool um, thing that kind of came out like job wise as well. Um, but I would also just love some pictures of the many cool projects that have come out of this class. So if you can put those on foundations, that would be cool. Um, all right, sharing my screen. I hope. Oh, look, there's there's the Zoom thing. I don't think we need that. Yeah. Um, all right, <laughs> we see and Fusion 360. Um, my blog um, on 3D design, um, my failures at first, um, 
it just it was it was a week um <laughs> a mm -hmm. lot of like completely stuck like what is that thing um this was a, a mesh yeah that's a thing i was like i don't want you there and escape undo it that one wouldn't go away um but so um i also had some other failures which i'll get into in a minute so i took a break and i got my um resin printing uh form labs badge Ooh. I have here. anyway um and so i made this little fox on the resin printer i would highly recommend um the the resin printer it was really easy <laughs> i hate to say yeah. i mean this wasn't anything i designed this did make me wonder about like these things like um some of the examples from class that really feel like very detailed and stuff i'm like i can't imagine designing this in fusion 360 with a bunch of shapes like yeah. are these scanned things like i don't know how we get like you, you had like a bender robot i think in there like characters and stuff are those yeah. just really good artists or how does that come to be that that's a really good question um those those are probably made in Blender or Maya or one of the artistically bent ones. So the the mesh that you had pop into existence on Fusion 360 is probably what this guy was drawn in, where you can grab, those are more designed as like digital clay pieces where you draw them out and can, can build them. There's some really good, like you can find artists that will draw things in Inkscape. Uh, you can find artists that draw things in 3D and like they, they just stream it. So it's a really cool one. That fox is probably somebody's 3D art. Cool, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. someone more talented than me. Um, so I went back to Fusion 360 after um, getting this badge. Um, I worked on the um, doghouse, modified it a little bit, making like a, a birdhouse that would go on a window. Um, and then I did the stamp thing that I posted in Foundations that um, it's a 30 minute tutorial, so it took me about 90 minutes to watch it going back and forth, you know, that thing. Um, but it works pretty well. And this is a good example where you can do this is a um, SVG. I just made the text in Inkscape because the sample SVG wasn't working for me. Um, but I would recommend this um, tutorial if, if folks are interested. So I did make this and I was very excited. Um, and then I tried to slice it and I was not excited and it did not go well. Um, this is what we talked about earlier when I realized mm -hmm. it's actually the slicer and not my file. Um, but I did actually get it to print mostly um, today. Um, I ran out of filament because uh... I let everything go right. But it's really OK because it was just the end of the handle. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I don't really need that. In fact, it ended up being more of a prototype because I found some design flaws. Um, so um, this is how it how it, I did some printing does not print great. Um, I've learned some things that, you know, if you print onto cork, you can see back here, um, that oh, gives a little okay. bit of give and that helped a little bit. Um, so I have some, I have some suggestions for it. The other thing that I really noticed that I was surprised about. So this is, I don't know if you can see, but this is, this is that, and it's made, what's cool is that this slides out so you can make other stamps and put them in. Um, but the design problem that I have is that I don't know if you could see before, but this base part is not the same width as this plate. So when you stamp it, it gives you all this pressure in the middle and not on the outside. Mm. Um, but luckily, now I know how you can just go and extrude that out and make that longer. So it's the same length as the plate. Um, and then so that will solve that problem. So maybe that's why I ran out of filament because I need to reprint this anyway. So it, it happens better. Um, but that was that. Yeah, that's really cool. That was a neat, um, a neat one to see pop into existence. We worked around that a little bit. And it was such a, I love that sort of cleverness in design and, and, and make those little stamp things. It's a really cool one. It's a good example for like going from Inkscape to Fusion where you could, you could have whatever geometry you wanted. So it's really cool. All right. Uh, there are four others still on the call. We've got Aaron, Anna, Ada, and Lila. Anybody want to? Aaron is first sure. on with the cam. Sure. Um, so I, I don't know if I showed this before, but I, I 3D printed this. This this looked familiar. Did I bring this up maybe last week or the week before? So really straightforward. What it does is it holds the batteries to my headset um, in a little stand, right? Um, yeah. Now you might be like, oh, cool. Uh, I have not been so excited about a thing. Like, you know, when you, you know, when you like get a, like a, a cool thing and you're like, how did nobody think like for five bucks, we could easily sell this other thing that helps them manage 
other things about the product we sold them. Well, anyway, um, I don't have anywhere to put my batteries, but that changed and it sits very nicely on like, uh, on where I charge them. So I'm happy about that. And, uh, actually the next thing I would like to 3d print, does anyone here have a sous vide machine? You know, like one of those like tubular things that you put into a, a pot of water. Love we have two. They're the best and thing. Make even, make get, even has get one. Them. You. Yeah. So, so basically what here, I'll, I'll, I'll get it. Um, it's basically just like a heating element with like a little simple computer and a water circulator. So like, or a, I guess a pump okay. maybe. Like a okay. tea kettle? Yeah. So like here it is, right. And uh... it has like a little screen on it and you put it in like a bowl of water and you plug it in and it has an app and you know, depending on what it is that you're cooking, it will get it to a specific temperature and keep it there for a very long time, depending on what you want to make. And you can cook a lot of food really, really easily with one of these things. That is so bougie. And I want one now. Get, trust me, get one. <laughs> like when I was in grad school, the, like, I was like, how do I make a lot of cheap food without doing any work at all? Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is there's no stand. So you get this like awkward lightsabery like thing. You don't know where to put it. The box that came in is ugly and doesn't really work that well. You can never get it together. So I'm going to make a stand for this. That's next. Yeah, like, a, I, like a clip to sit on the side of the pan? Yep. 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 Or no, to sit called? on. A, a sous vide, a sous vide machine. Here, I'll spell it sous vide. Like it's this. called an immersion circulator. Yeah. And and it's Kate's comment on steaks, like you could you could go out and buy like a cheap cut of steak and put it in a sous vide machine. It'd be just as good as like a fancy steak you'd get at a restaurant easily. So. It's also you, I, they're key for uh, ramen eggs. True. Yeah. What do you mean you put them in the machine? So you have to wrap the thing that you put it in, like, like seal it in plastic. Yeah. And then it goes in this water uh, bag. Like so a vacuum than having the center of your steak at medium rare temperature, the whole thing will be that one temperature that you set or your ramen. At, I think, what is it like a 36 degree? I don't know. There's a special yeah. degree egg to make this perfect egg for ramen, ramen soup. And it just cooks it to exactly the right temperature because it keeps the water bath at the right temperature. Is all the food, food wrapped in plastic? That doesn't sound healthy to boil plastic <laughs> well it's not boiling <laughs> your so, food but that's that is an interesting point um it's not for a very long time and it's not super hot so um it depends on what it is like for example i did it on uh, ahi tuna steaks last night and it was only at 115 degrees it's like the same temperature of what comes out of your faucet like so but um, you don't need a fancy uh, air sealer to do it. You could easily just use like a water immersion method and force all the air out of like a Ziploc bag, for example. Um, and to Kate's comment about steaks, what's cool too is that for, for meats, um, it will, since there's nowhere for the moisture of the meat to go, it'll circulate within the cut of meat. Um, and the results are pretty fantastic. So. This is extravagant. Thank you for sharing. I, I, you know what? It would be my sincere pleasure to cook for all of you once things yeah. like normalize. Like, I would love that. I would love to cook for you all. If, if oh, you have me. actually going to do a sous vide class, um, like a sous vide tasting and class, um, that we were planning before the pandemic that obviously got yeah. put on hold, but that will that will happen, and it's a very cool tool. Oh yeah, we should do in a non-pandemic time. We would totally have a gastronomy week. We like make weird foods. <laughs> that'd be that'd delightful. And then um, the, next, the next piece that you add to that is the torch, the sears all that attaches onto the torch so you can sear the outside of the steak, which we may also have. <laughs> awesome. All right, uh, Lila and Anna, your cameras are on. You wanna share what you've been up to? Whoever unmutes first. Anna. Uh, um, struggling with Fusion 360, I made a doghouse. That's pretty much the only thing I've managed to make. I'm fooling around with some stuff in Illustrator, trying to figure out how to pull it into Fusion 360 and actually extrude it. Um, maybe I'll figure that out. Maybe I won't. I, I'm uh, sure you will. <laughs> we'll see. I may switch to the iPad, um, shaper app 
because I have yeah. an Apple Pencil, and that might be more intuitive for me. I highly recommend it. Yeah, there, somebody there probably test that this week and see what I come up with. I'm also trying to get Blender. I have a friend who is going to help me with Blender and see if I can maybe work out something like that, like a little figure um, yeah. that's a little bit more about, it ties more into my skill set of actually sculpting clay. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, I may try that as well. Uh, and then uh, on Thursday, I went in and I soldered the shield for the Arduino board um, and came across the unique problem of too much flux. So my board doesn't work, but it's very pretty. <laughs> yeah, beautiful solder joints. But like, I don't know how it happened, but but we hit a, a too much flux. It was bridging when it wasn't bridging, like the solder wasn't there. Yeah, it was very strange. and. When we put the heat on all of the, on, not all of them, but on the pins, like all the heat. Uh, when we hit it with the heat gun, not the heat gun, the the iron, um, you could see it bubbling and all the flux was bubbling out of the holes in all of these yeah. pins. And it was really weird to watch because it was like metal boiling and that was yeah. not supposed to happen. Um, I I was too encouraging with all the flux and then. <laughs> I was just trying to make sure that I didn't like burn anything. And I guess I just got like, oh, flux is going to keep that from happening. And I just got, got too eager. Uh, but the LEDs work and the button works and the potentiometer kind of works, but then it stopped working. Uh, so, uh, and then my encoder doesn't work at all but I'm going to solder a new one, do a whole new board, and this time actually take pictures because I didn't actually take pictures when I did it because I was too into soldering. Um, so I'm going to do that again. Um, and then uh, my the hope is that I design a print plate in 360 uh, instead of uh, embossed, I'm going to deboss it. So actually the flat surface is my black and my white is all debossed. Um, so rather than having it like, so the opposite of the way that Kate had it, where it was like, uh, like kind of extruded out. So I'm just going to have like a completely flat surface. And then there's going to be like almost like engraved, but it's not engraved into it. And I'm trying to see if I can do that with Fusion 360, but I think I might be more successful in Shaper, but we'll see how that works out. But um, you totally can. I can, it, we'll wait until you're done, but I can show. I'll get it queued up to show you. Okay. Um, and then uh, what's the other thing? Oh, so I follow this brewery on Instagram um, over in. Chester, and they have a neon sign that's not made out of neon. It's made out of using the Adafruit uh, neon tubing. And <laughs> I made my partner specifically drive out to this brewery so we could go look at the sign so we could actually see how it was built. Uh, but uh, the we must have gotten like a guy on a really crappy day because he was just like not understanding my questions about the sign and he's just, just like like I wanted to actually like go up to it and look at it and I was like would it be okay if I like got a closer look and he just got really weird and he's just like we really aren't supposed to have people here like it's really only takeout only and so I was like ah but it looks really cool like it's a high nine brewery and they have this really amazing neon sign that's not neon, but it looks like neon and it's really bright. And I'm trying to see if I can make something like that as my final project, but. So yeah, I went to Chester to go look at a neon sign. That was my big adventure <laughs> this week. <laughs> that's fun. Oh, I, yeah, I think I have, I think I found it. Okay. It's well, at least the brewery's website. There's, there's a, it's a really good way, like those logo signs, if you, I, I'm a hundred percent sure 
someone could have a business about building those signs for businesses if you really nailed it and like figured out exactly what you'd need to do each time, which would be really cool. Like a totally legitimate sign making business, tons of opportunity. All right, Lila, you wanna tell us what you're up to? Hi, um, I tried mounting my Arduino eyes and that didn't work. I got work. my 3D printing badge and I printed this little shark clip and I'm working on, I went, I'm going the SolidWorks route. It's been a while, probably over 15 years since I've touched this software, but um, I'm kind of remembering how to use it. And I'm watching the Linda tutorials, which are slow and many, many hours long, but uh, that's where I am for the week. Cool. And I, I would say you, you definitely did more than just like flatly, it didn't work with the eyes on, on the thing. I thought that it you really like made a ton of progress. You had a beautiful little wooden piece to put them into. Two of my wires of... fell out. So like it, it wasn't even lighting up today and I didn't have enough male to female connectors just to mm. hook it up to a breadboard to show everyone. So I ordered more connectors and I think I'm just gonna use a breadboard and mount mm. it that way. And breadboards have a nice sticky back, so you can totally just stick them onto the back of the thing and go from there. So yeah, there's ton, tons of opportunity. And sometimes going down roads that don't end the way you want, even though it's disheartening for sure, uh, you, can, you can learn a lot, so. Cool. Um, and um. then... Ada, I mean, have you been up to anything exciting? Yeah, I'm happy to show some stuff, but uh, can we like pause the recording? Mm -hmm. Kate is on it. I'm trying. Okay. There's there's tons of cool things to take from that. Um, just to see all of those shapes come together to like go through the process of having like I imagine the sketch. Oh, was are sort we of we're recording again. I was just gonna say we are recording again, so let me know if we shouldn't be. <laughs> If there's more to show, we can stop. No. So to, so to put in the recording, let me just say, that was an awesome design and it was really cool. I imagine that you started with some sketches and then from there was, was able to, were able to slowly build out the idea to what you wanted, which is, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. Corey, if I can just jump in for one second, um, because it, it, that was stunning and so cool to see. Um, and it reminded me of, of something, um, when you when you're doing the arm cuff that it was just something that i just wanted to pass along to other people um that actually my husband did a couple of years ago for my daughter's halloween costume so nothing to the level of the beautiful <laughs> intricacies that you were showing us um but if you you or anyone is ever thinking of kind of um using pla for like a prototype for something with a curve like that um mm -hmm. share my screen real quick this does live in um way back in slack are you guys seeing this now Yes. Yeah. Right. So, um, so this was a 3D print that my husband made um, with PLA um, and then put it in hot water um, and then it just becomes pliable, oh. curved it and made it into a, a, a cuff for my daughter. Um, so it was, you know, if you had a design like that, um, you could yeah, yeah. do like a, a prototype kind of thing of it. Um, and also for anyone else, if you wanted just a simple way to be thinking about things in a different way that you might be able to use the PLA and mold it and bend it, that that is a possible thing. You can find it on Slack from October of 2018. Yeah, that's a... Yeah, thank never... you. Yeah, that's a cool one. It reminds me of uh, the most recent Enable Hand. So this is a, there's a, what's how, there we go. I'm gonna share my screen for a few things. That reminds me of, if you haven't seen this, you're gonna you're gonna really enjoy it. These are like little 3D printed hands for uh, usually they're for kids, right? So these are 3D printed appendages, hands, or even arm features. And there's tons of different um, ways that these can be made. But one of them, I'm trying to find the get involved, donate, how to make an enable device. And so these are, these are hands that have been designed. The most recent ones use exactly that trick. 
so that you can heat up the, the design and then mold it to the arm of the person who needs it, where this hand is, is put on there. Enable, let's see, devices catalog. It's my, it's apparently not loading. We're very slowly on the internet. But um, in here, there's all sorts of different options. So across here, you can see these are largely for kids that are missing fingers. And so these are 3D printed items where when they turn their wrist, the fingers will close because of some tension pieces. And they these were all designed parametrically. So you can put in the age of the kid and, the, and like measure their wrist. They work really nicely. That's actually a really heartwarming uh, piece. This is more like a, a big play one for adults, but you can imagine that there's some, some interesting flex to make this work. Uh, but for a kid who's going to grow very quickly, they would need a new prosthetic all the time and prosthetics being outrageously expensive. These are stand-ins where you can quickly add some functionality. It's not like a full hand, but it's some functionality for a handful of dollars instead of hundreds or thousands of dollars when they're going to need a new one every couple of months because they're growing like weeds, right? Um, and so it's a, it's a really neat way. The school that I was at actually was able to print and use one of, one of the students needed a hand. And we happened to have the CAD class that was next door to mine that, that could print them a hand. So they would print them a new hand every year. But their, their newest models totally use that heat and, heat and bend technique. It's really cool. Uh, let's see. There's, there's tons of neat options there. Ooh, the other thing I was going to show is the emboss tool, which is a good one. Um, although it looked like somebody had a question in the chat and my chat has again disappeared. I don't know what happened. No, I just put the link in. You're good. Oh, cool. Um, oh, this is, I think that we did, I did some of this with somebody. So we could say foundations of fabrication. Woo, we do this. You can play around with some of your things. One of the pieces that we saw, we were playing with this a little bit this week was if you want to make a sticker, you probably want to do it backwards. And so these are, these are totally tools that you can use. You can play around with all your fonts. Cambria is maybe not the best choice, but we'll, we'll go a little bit bigger. Let's do 0 0.5. So here's, here is a sketch with that. It, so this is just drawn with text on top of another body. There's an emboss option. I don't know what just freaked out there. Uh, I think with Zoom and OBS and Fusion running, my, my um, computer is getting wacky. But on here, my sketch profiles, I should be able to select this text. And then the faces would be that. And sketch profiles, maybe I can choose if it hasn't freaked out completely. Let's hide the body and grab it. Yeah, okay, we've got it selected. Bring the body back into existence. It's saying that I'm creating something that's not visible. That's, that's fine. Here I can extrude these in a few different directions. I can go above or I can go below. So if Anna, you were trying to go into, you could use this tool right here and it'll do a cutaway so that you can get a deboss for the shape that you want. And so this, right now I'm using it with text, but you could totally use it with whatever design you wanted. So you could import an SVG if you had one that you liked uh, and you wanted to, to do. It also could be an interesting way to make things if you wanted to. Emboss depth value is invalid, adjust depth. Okay. So if we hit okay, it should calculate what just happened and make it, make it so. So yeah, there's a way to do that sort of debossed text and reversed so that it would come through in a stamp. You can totally do it in Fusion 360. You just need to put in, you can either insert your vector file from an SVG over here, and then you can do the emboss tool. And actually the, if you look at the emboss tool, it's cooler than this, because I just embossed onto a flat surface. But if you look at that example, it's actually along a curved surface, which is one of the things that I was thinking about in, I was thinking about making this curved bench. This is what, I was getting into, and I've got a lot loaded on my computer right now. 
Uh, but this is the curved bench that I was thinking about. And here's my emboss tool. If I zoom back to here, I have a sketch on a construction plane. This is just like a, a sketch that's floating in the air way above. And I use that as an emboss tool because I figured I wanted a seat dish on this bench. So I went with the emboss tool like that to make a seat dish that cuts down into there. And a couple more actions, boom, cut that lip off to the front. This is the emboss tool, but you can see that it embosses like across even a curved surface. So if you wanted to have a rolly stamp where like you roll it on, you could make a rolled surface and then emboss across that rolled surface or deboss across that rolled surface. So you could roll a stamp onto something, which is a really cool opportunity. This is totally more of a bench. And this is a good example for what you could do with slicer. If so, nobody wants, oh yeah, uh, what's up? No, so, um... How how big an angle can can like an angle of a curved surface can that handle? Because I've I've been wondering this about Fusion three hundred and sixty, and I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you because this is actually like a functionality that Shaper doesn't have that I wish it had. Um, but I do, I do a lot of projecting sketches onto new planes and stuff, um, or like. Or uh, yeah, or, or taking taking a sketch and then and then projecting it like as edges onto a curved surface, that kind of stuff. Um, but I would really like to not project. Like I well, I would like to be able to, in addition to projecting sketches, like wrap them. Yeah, you know what totally. I mean. Um, and that kind of functionality is not in Shaper, three D. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, if I had a sketch, could I wrap it 360 around a cylinder like that? Okay, that's that's what I'm trying right now. So we're gonna draw a sketch right on here. This new sketch, let's draw in something weird. We're gonna go with a inscribed polygon and we'll do a few of them. Let's go this way. And then I'm gonna grab just a, a line like that and make it a construction line. And now you, I'm going to just make a little rectangular array to like see how this, how this goes. Um, rectangular pattern, direction, let's go that direction and we'll go bajoop and bajoop. And maybe I want to go this way, symmetric. There we go. Okay, so now I've got this, here's just like a collection of hexagons that looks kind of fun. I don't know. That's a that's a neat design, and yeah. so when uh, oh, I don't want them to be construction lines, uh, so I need to get out of the construction line mode. Line type, not construction. Nope. Don't do that. Back. So this is like oh okay great they're not, um, and I'm gonna undo what I just did because I wanted to make it look slightly different, and so. Objects to select, grab these, see if I can make it faster. So there's a lot of times where this happens, right? Where, where you have to do it. Okay, so back to this. Testing, we go like that, we go like this, and instead we want it to be symmetric. So this is, I think, a reasonable design. We hit okay, there they are. And now I'm gonna say create, nope, finish that sketch. Now this create an emboss. And it really like, I forget all of these things. So we're just gonna, those, so like, I just had to remember that that was it. Sketch profiles, I have nine selected. The faces, do this face. And it looks like that's gonna be a magical deboss. When I do it here, it totally wrapped it around the cylinder. That's not just like it extruding back into it, that's wrapped around. Um. Okay, if you made it if you made it twice as wide, would it would it go? Yep. Like I, I don't think that that went more than 180 degrees around, did it? Nope. I think you're totally right. So I can go in here and edit this, and I will change the first off. I'm gonna grab you and go that way, and this I'll move around. We'll just extend it out like that and then sort of drag this 
into existence. I think if I grab this one, it should, well, if we do this and sort of yeah. rotate like that. Okay. Finish sketch and try this again. Um, grab all of these and say create emboss and then carefully choose our body to be this and hit okay. Uh, I maybe just hit 360. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure. It looks like it gets really close if it doesn't do it. But uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, that's. So it totally, like it, it gets really close, right? Those are the sorts of things that it's, th these are like the weird things that can decide one software or another for you. Can I ask, um, mm -hmm. would it Fusion 360 have, so like if you're trying to like construct like a screw, you would want that spiral carved mm -hmm. in like, I guess not really embossed, but like carved into that cylinder. There has to be yeah. a way to do that. And I wonder if that would also, cause that's definitely 360. Yeah, well, actually so I there. wouldn't, so I wouldn't necessarily want like a repeated pattern, but say, all right. So like if, if I wanted to draw a landscape, if I wanted to take a design that was similar to what was on the bracelet and you know, have it on like a, and, and so it's on a, you know, sort of like a digital piece of paper that is the same dimensions as like the height of the cylinder and then the circumference of the cylinder. Then I want to like wrap that piece of paper around the cylinder in essence and have that sketch go on to the cylinder. Yeah, I you think, understand what I mean? yeah, I totally understand what you mean. I was just, uh, I was just pointing out that if, if, it, if the program can do threading and the program can do embossed almost, it, it, like, I feel like there should be a way to make it work because it's not too different of an operation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just saying, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of something that my partner did uh, sculpture that he made that did have some sort of like debossed effect on it that went all the way around it and I can't remember how he did it um, but I want to say that I, I think it's possible I think it's possible to do 360. Yeah. So is there a way in Fusion 360 Corey to instead of having that go directly to being embossed or debossed. So in, instead of it being, uh, instead of it just being uh, a change to the solid, mm -hmm. to have that become um, edges or sketches on the surface of the cylinder? Oof. Um, I don't know. Okay. This is this is like new territory for me. Okay. Um, but it the emboss tool seems like a, a useful one. There's also like in here in tools, there are add-ins. So it's not impossible that someone could have written a script or an add-in. So it's like you can extend Fusion 360. It's it just takes a lot of work. Um but those are, and like utilities, compute all, manage materials. There's all sorts of things that you can do. Not all of which, I, I don't even want to pretend like I know all of these things. How yeah, did you yeah, etch and that, and my, oh, so I was just going to ask how you etched the, the robot I did on and it, would that be similar? Mm, that was actually a lot similar, simpler because it was just laser engraving on top of the design. Uh, and it was a flat piece, so I didn't have to worry about it. I was definitely building it in such a way that, right, right. Uh, like for the dust shoe here, it's this one. This one takes a minute to load. It was, this is just like a representative vector that I put on the front. 
so that but when that I was explored, laser printing so that just wasn't yeah different, yeah it was totally different. different process yep just laser okay. cut the thing it's not even those are just lines on top of it they're not even yeah but it, it came up with a similar effect like at the end of the day it was a similar thing this is also a neat i didn't want to even include this in the first lesson but these are sheet metal parts which is its own whole cool thing where you can plan in bends and like if i you can you can do this inside of some 3d design software where i can get the flat pattern for that stationary face and so that piece has here it is flattened out a bent piece of plastic and then there's the bend lines so that you can manage all of this this is something that i'm just starting to get better at but you can totally design pieces deliberately so that they are bent later intended to be for sheet metal but in this case i used it for acrylic so there's a whole collection of tools that you can use that are that go way way deeper than than we've explored yeah there's ton and look at look at how ridiculous this modeling was right these are collections of things and if i extend them all out i can hit play on this from the beginning and it'll just sort of walk through all of the different pieces that I did to make it happen. So eventually you, you may get better at 3D design and be able to plop through all of these different pieces to make them come into existence. Oh, and these groups, it just hops right past the whole group all in once. So there's, there's totally good reasons to look at those also. And I can, um, I think I can share, I, I think I have a shared design for this. I can put the design for this. Go. Oh, night guys. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. help with that, Corey. No problem. I think I can take and put a public link to this guy out into the world. I'll drop it into the chat, which maybe I can see. Nope, I can't see, but I'll put it in foundations chat so that you can play around with that design. You'd be able to download it and look at it if you wanted to um, and go through Infusion. But let me do the stop share. I think we're good.